Hello, and thank you for joining us for the 2022 Backyard Wildlife Series, Session 3. This presentation is sponsored by Butler Soil and Water Conservation District, Hamilton Conservation Corp, and the Ohio State University Extension Office. At the start of the presentation, we were having some technical difficulties, so the first two to three minutes were not recorded. We apologize for the inconvenience, but we hope you enjoy the presentation. Uh, it's just really uh, uh, a lot. That's so, so there's not really a, uh, uh, a, a big hard number on how much light you, you need or anything like that, but there are some good things to follow. Um, ground, ground up fixtures should be as close to 27K, and the K stands for Kelvin, which is a temperature setting in, in lighting but less than 3000 Kelvin. And we'll get to exactly why that is here in just a minute. And if you're doing moonlighting or downcast lighting, like from a tree or from uh, a, um, uh, a yard arm or something, it can be as high as 4000 Kelvin, but you really don't want to go any higher for that moonlight effect. Only illuminate what you really need to. So um, use hoods, shields. Um, you, you want to try to polarize the light so it's going only where you want it to. Uh, and then you don't want to leave the lights on all night long. I mean, you know, it's, we have, we have our landscape lighting. It comes on once it gets, you know, dusk sets in and it goes off at, you know, midnight or 1 a.m. That way, you know, most people that are driving, they see the house and moving on it. They're already gone at home in bed. The, the bugs don't want to see it anyway. So uh, that's, that's always a good thing is to, have that got it okay thank you and then um so in that uh in the uh, dark sky uh, association they have a lot of really good things in there they have principles for responsible outdoor lighting so uh like night lights uh, security lights a lot of times they're just left on all night long i, I can remember flying over uh different cities uh, in commercial airliners and very shortly after you take off you've got a really good view of of the uh, of the city at only you know a few thousand feet and it it was remarkable the number of completely empty parking lots that were fully lit up like daylight for absolutely no reason um, so you know being responsible about well do we really need to have those lights on all the time or not really um, if you, if you pull up a, a, a Google search and you ask for a, um, light pollution map, you will be astounded. You'll be astonished at how much light, uh, there is given off every night. And, um, it, it is very difficult to find dark sky, uh, anywhere in the Eastern United States anymore. It is tough. Um, so, uh, what you, we want to do is do the best we can and then talk to everybody else and friends and neighbors and talk talk them into doing the best they can when we come to doing uh lighting so uh these are some of the uh illuminations of the international dark skies association make sure it's useful it has a clear purpose make sure it's targeted it only goes where you want it to go um and use low light levels you don't, don't have to be really really bright uh, uh controlled timers ocean detectors and then the color and this is where we're going to get into here in just a second, the color. Um, these are different kinds of lighting. Upward lighting, uh, upward reflected lighting. Uh, you see the useful lighting. It's a very small part of that. Glare and light trespass. Um, now, we talked about there's not a lot of uh, ordinances against a lot of lighting, but light trespass is the one that you can probably uh, talk to somebody and actually get something done. Uh, if somebody puts up, including the city, they put up a street light and it, you know, glares light right through your bedroom window, that's light trespass. And, and it really, really shouldn't look like that. I mean, if this is what you're getting, uh, that's, that's probably not a good thing. And there's, there's definitely some, uh, something to be said about uh, talking to somebody about that. And always be respectful and, and, and talk to them, explain to them, hey, this is, this is you know, coming right in my window. And most all the companies that build all of these fixtures for 
municipalities or commercial properties, they have uh, barn doors, hoods, shades, shields, everything that controls how the light uh, uh, goes. And then uh, this is uh, this is sky glow. Um, and you can just see that all the indiscriminate light around there just shining up and it just lights up all of the uh, particles of dust and everything else in the sky. And um, that's that's just the way things are right now. You can actually go out in the middle of the night and you can tell where every city in Ohio is almost. Uh, now, these are commercially produced lampposts. I, I cannot believe somebody would actually pay almost $300 for one of these. This has got to be one of the worst lights I've ever seen in my life. The light bulb is up in the little black dome of that of that uh, bullard and it shines down right onto a mirror right into your eyes so it, it is it's essentially just blinding you uh, that's glare that is out and out you know glare there's nothing good about that if you'll notice it makes really hard shadows uh, along the street edge there uh, all of the lights in this picture actually are are hard glare lights and um that's just not really a good thing. And these are bright white. Uh, the ones up on the big posts up there, they're sort of okay. They're, they're down a little bit in temperature wise, but, but uh, these white ones here are probably in the 6,000 Kelvin range, which is not, not where we wanna go. And we'll get to that right now. So when you talk about light, this is the light of the, the human eye. Uh, bugs and, and uh, certain mammals, they see the light at the smaller nanometer wavelength that's all the way to the right differently than we do. They are more perceptive than we are. And the blue light that everybody's been hearing about from their TVs, their computer monitors, everything like that, that's in the 520 nanometer to 500 nanometer range. And that's what we want to try to eliminate out of all of our landscape lighting. That's why I should be on that does a couple of things. One, it's bad for human beings, um, but it also messes up, uh, like I said, insects and some of their, uh, what they're looking for, their navigation, things like that. So we're gonna be down farther below or above uh, the, the 550 down towards 565. And this is what that looks like in a light bulb. So the temperature scale, anywhere from 6,000 to 7,000 Kelvin is you're getting to that blue light and it's, it's, it's just really bad. We're looking down on the far left-hand side, no higher than 3,000, closer down towards 2,004 um, lighting that you, you, you set on the ground and gravity is a great thing. You just have to you know, put the thing, the stake in the ground and the cord stays on the ground and cover it up with mulch, it's great. Um, but if that light is gonna shine up onto a building, you want it to be in that lower range. Now, like I said, if you're doing the moonlight or downcast lighting from up in the trees down, you can go up to 4,000 and not cause a problem with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the animals. Now, now we have LEDs, we get to pick that a lot easier than we used to be able to. It used to be incandescent bulbs were way down in that range anyway, so it was never a big problem. Then we started getting real fancy with our light bulbs. Now we have to pay closer attention. So where do you buy all this stuff? Um, big box stores, Amazon, special lighting companies, anywhere, so long as you can see the specifications and follow the guidelines for the responsible landscape lighting. Um, 2,700 to 3,000 Kelvin for up lighting, 4,000 for down lighting. Uh, I mean, really, that's it. Uh, no more than, than 525 lumens. And I thought, gee, many Christmas, that's not very much. I started looking and uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, um, Menards uh, are the three big boxes around here. And then uh, a few specialty shops. Every one of them has lights that are way down in that range that are, they, they're certified by dark sky. So it's not hard to find and they're not really expensive. So, you know, that part of it is really easy. Um, and I need a designer. Okay. That's the next thing I'm hearing. People say, I need a designer. Well, I would be more than happy to take your money, but you really don't need a designer because what a designer is going to come in and do, he's going to create this vision that's his um, or hers to what they want to see at your house or your business. And, you know, it, it's better if you use your vision. What would you like to see? 
and then just go practice. Go buy some inexpensive lights, tie them up in a tree uh, for moonlighting or set them up on the ground, light up a wall or a shrub till you start seeing what you want to see. Because I mean, if you pay a designer and he puts all this stuff in and it's going to be really expensive and you go, yeah, that's nice, but that's just not really what I want. You're kind of out of luck at that point. Uh, once you get some of the stuff, you go, yeah, I really like that. Walk around. Uh, make sure you aren't casting light somewhere where you shouldn't. Um, you know, especially like if you're up casting from the ground up, uh, you, you tend to try to, uh, I know I do, I'm trying to make sure I've got the whole side of the building or whatever. And then you don't realize that you're a foot past the building and now you've got glare coming off your light going, you know, who knows where. So walk around, make sure that you're not you know, sending light somewhere you're, you shouldn't be. And, um, and then, uh, you know, try different effects of it, you know, uh, wall wash with a, a light right up against the wall shining up or one 20 feet away. There's a lot of different things to do. And you're the best person to figure out what makes you happy when you're looking at your own house or your own business. So um, just give that a try. I mean, I think we maybe went out and spent 30 or $40 on a couple of different lights and we played with them here and there and everywhere. And, and we've gotten to where we, we have some things we like and we just, we just build on that and move on. Um, so the next slides I'm just going to go through real quick. These are all of uh, the resources that the International Dark Sky Association has. And um, if Lynn shares this, this um, slideshow with you guys, you can download it. All of these blue titles, uh, if, you, if you control click them, they will actually take you to an entire uh, document from uh, Dark Sky about outdoor lighting and the different aspects of how to, to do things correctly. So we'll, we'll click through them here, but they are, are very much into it. They teach you what to do, the right colors. Um, to, just to give you an idea, you can find a really neat um, a light fixture. I really like this light fixture. It's gonna be out in the open where people are gonna see it, but it normally comes with a light that's let's say uh, 6,000 Kelvin. Well, they make filters that go in those lights that change that down to 2700 Kelvin so that you actually get the correct uh, color of light for nighttime so that you're not interfering with um, uh, the, the animals or with, with our own circadian rhythm. So uh, that, that's one of just those things you need to ask for. Um, you can find uh, dark sky friendly lighting. They have places that are a uh, seal of approval. Uh, like I told you, I, I looked at, at Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, they both are. They have products that are. And then you have uh, different retailers that are specialty shops that are, will do that. Um, if you don't have a lighting ordinance, this will help, help your, your town come up with one or, or maybe start down that, that street of, of you know, finding policies that, that make a good idea. Do we really need all these lights on at the baseball diamond all night long for no reason because there's really nobody there? Um, Residential business lighting. Uh, with the aesthetics of businesses, a lot of times planning departments have them put uh, big, big um, shrubbery barriers up in front of the parking lot so you don't have to see the ugly parking lot. Well, the same idea can happen with light trespass and light pollution. You can talk to them about maybe making, uh, you know, things that go into how they set up businesses so that the lighting doesn't have to be just uh, willy nilly and go everywhere. And they don't just set up these these huge floodlights that, you know, lights up half the city. Um, and then your neighbor's light. I know we have neighbors that lights shine where we don't want them to shine. And you just have to go talk to them and, and, and try to help figure out a problem. But, you know, a light on somebody else's house shining <sighs> into your house is definitely a problem. And, and it's not something that you should have to um, endure. I mean, that's, that's, that's not, that's not right. So, um, and in bad street lights, we talked about that. Uh, you know, you, you you go talk to city officials, uh, and they'll you know they'll tell you, oh well, you know, there's there's nothing we can do about it. Well, yeah, there always usually is something they can do about it. And um, uh, they say, well, we want it, we want it uh, so that it's it's uh, protecting everybody. Well, it's you have to do lighting correctly 
for it to be protected. If you simply have a lot of bright lights around, um, there's a study out that's actually on this page that shows that it is no uh, greater protection to have bright lighting around from being mugged than having no lighting around because the bright lighting creates too many, too many harsh shadows. It actually highlights you, the victim, so that the stalker can get a better idea of when to attack you. So there's a proper way to do lighting and an improper way to do lighting. So um, bad street lighting is a problem. And, and, and again, respectful to the, the elected officials and the, the city workers trying to figure out how to make this work. Um, and then um, come up with model lighting laws. Like I said, the, the one at the beginning, that's a, that's a model from uh, IDA and it's okay. Uh, I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, especially with uh, when you look at the different neighborhoods and, you know, uh, the neighborhood we live in is very traditional. I mean, you can reach out the window and hand a cup of coffee to your neighbor without going outside. I mean, window to window. And there are some neighborhoods where you have, uh, you know, uh, 80, 90 feet between houses um, or more. So it, it's, it's all gotta be taken care of. Um, there also is an LED practical guide just because you get LEDs doesn't mean that, that you've got the right LED. You have to consider what, what color you're putting in there for what things and, and how it affects uh, everything around it. Um, now the new messaging boards. I know there is a big hullabaloo about messaging boards. Uh, they are extraordinarily bright. Um, if they're done incorrectly, they are bad. If they are done correctly, they actually can create a net reduction in sky brightness, but they have to be done correctly. Um, I know there are some around town that when you start to walk or, or drive towards them, uh, it looks like there's a police car has somebody pulled over because of all the dancing lights they have on them. And it's just really kind of um, annoying and it, it's really distracting. Uh, and then the, uh, the lights they have, around some of the big picture windows of stores now that are just on 24 seven, just the strip lights. Um, there's no need for that. Uh, that's just, uh, and most of those are usually brilliant white light. Um, so that's, that, that's something that should be uh, uh, looked into. Um, so good luck to everybody. Now I've put a couple of things on here. If you wanna copy these down, uh, most of the information you're gonna need is right there at thedarksky.org. Um, and they, they have everything that's on, almost everything that's on here on this slideshow is available on Dark Sky. And um, every, it's fun, so funny, if you go to a lot of different other uh, resources, almost every one of them at some point in time or another point right back to Dark Sky. So start where that is, and I think you're already better off. There's a couple of really good videos on YouTube for anybody that is kind of worried about trying to set up their own lighting. Uh, there's a company uh, out west, and um, uh, they actually go through uh, YouTube um, videos talking to people about how to light their houses. And now they're actually in the business of of designing and selling lighting products and things like that. So, I mean, it's they're not cutting their nose off to spite their face. They're really telling people how they can do things if they want to, or if they, you know, they have more money than than they 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 know what to do with. They can hire them and, and go do that. Um, and I will open that to any questions when I don't know how to do this. And Stop share. I'll have a comment. Um, on Wednesday, I can put this on our website so okay. people can access those links for those yes. other documents and for those videos. Okay. Stop sharing. Yes. Hey, there's everybody. Question. Question. Uh, turn, your mics on. Uh, turn your mics on and <clears throat> if there's no questions, I'm going to let Kathy take over. I don't see any questions. I just wanted to say thank you very much for um, the information that it's really good to have a source to go to to find out what, how to talk to people about it. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Huh? I didn't do what I wanted to do. What do you got? <laughs> it scares me. It does things like that. <coughs> okay. Why is that up there? Because it's not screen sharing properly. Well, I don't have screen sharing. Yet. 
Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so there is actually a dark sky community in Ohio. It's international through the International Dark Sky Association, and it's up in and I always say this wrong, Giaga County. Giaga. Yeah, that place. Um, so they ha actually have like a whole community, and it's um, around where their observatory is. So the whole community's gone in for like low lighting and everything else. And what's so funny is the actually the closest dark sky in Ohio is down here in. In, in southern Ohio, if you look at the dark sky map, like southeast Ohio, uh, yeah, there's there's one spot over here between here and Portsmouth, and then over east of east of here, Adams County. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So. there's nobody lives down there. <laughs> You're up. Am I? Where am I on screen share? <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. We're going to be talking about nighttime creatures here in just a few minutes. Mm. There we go. So check with them that they can see your. All right. Can everybody see that slide that says bat moths and other nighttime creatures? Uh, maybe not because it just disappeared. Wow. No, we can see yeah, it. We can see it. You can it's see bad. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, did your my turn die? Okay. All right. All right. My name's Kathy. We're going to be talking about uh, nighttime creatures. Uh, we're going to tie that into our um, conversation about lighting. Hang on a second. How are we doing? Okay. All right. Mm. Um, so our nighttime creatures, we need to protect from all the light pollution. Uh, I one of my favorite uh, statistics about mosquito lights is that in actuality, they kill a greater percent of moths than they do mosquitoes. Um, so that's always disheartening. Uh, you, you've got all these moths running around there. They are going to the lights. They become absolutely cannon fodder for everything that's out there. There should be, you know, normal predatory behavior, but whenever you've got them around the lights, you know, those little bats and stuff just sit out there and pick them off like crazy. Um, so we're going to talk about bat moths and other nighttime creatures. Um, bats are one of the most important misunderstood animals around. Recent studies estimate that bats eat enough pests to save more than $1 billion per year in crop damage and pesticide costs in the United States in the corn industry alone. Agriculturally, it was $3.6 billion dollars. Um, so if you're looking at soybeans and, and all the other crops that we have, uh, yeah, 3.6 billion. It's 1 billion in corn industry only. Bats are declining globally due to uh, mostly human interference, uh, habitat destruction, senseless gil killing due to unfounded fear. Um, I don't know how many of you have that, uh, if it's a bat, I'm going to kill it mentality. Uh, but there are a lot of people out there that that feel like that. Um, disruption, disruption of hibernation and white nose syndrome. Disruption of hibernation is simply, this is mostly the white nose syndrome and the disruption of hibernation are for cave dwelling or cave hibernating bats. And what happens is that particularly we'll be talking about um, the Indiana bat later. It is on the endangered list, uh, and most of it is because of disruption of hibernation. They only hibernate in a few caves, and whenever you go into those caves during hibernation season and disrupt the bats, uh, they leave, they fly out, uh, they get cold, they don't come back. White nose syndrome is a fungus that is in the caves, and it is uh, it can be transmitted from bat to bat. It can be transmitted from cave to bat it can be transmitted from cave to cave. And the way it happens cave to cave is that we tramp into a cave that has a population of bats that have white nose syndrome. And then we don't clean our boots, we don't clean our shoes and we tramp into another cave and we've contaminated another cave. It's a whole nother population of bats that are gonna be contaminated with white nose syndrome. How can we help? 
Um, be a bat ambassador and spread the word that they're really not horrible, nasty creatures. They're actually kind of cool. Uh, turn off unnecessary lights. Watch for bats. We have bats around our house. They're absolutely amazing at night to watch all their acrobats catching the, the uh, mosquitoes. Um, they can eat thousands of mosquitoes each evening. Prom promote natural habitat around your home. Uh, they like tall trees. They like deciduous or, con or conifer trees. Um, don't use a lot of pesticides because your bats are eating your bugs. Your bugs are eating your pesticides and they all go into that food chain. Provide shelter by installing a bat box. Bat boxes are amazing. Once you get a, a colony of bats around your house uh, and your property, you, you will just sit in the lawn chair at dusk and just watch them come and go. They are fun. Avoid disturbing bats. Um, we've talked about the, the, the uh, disturbance of hibernation. Please be respectful. If you're out and, and you're going caving, know if that cave has a bat population. If you don't know if that cave has a bat population, don't go in there. If it's posted that it is a bat cave um, where there is a population, don't go in anyway. And um, remove unwanted bats humanely. I can't imagine anybody not wanting a bat, but if you do have a bat and you don't want it in your house, please don't just kill it. There are lots of um, organizations out there that will come and rescue that bat. However, I just found out that if you call someplace like Critter Gears, that they have to kill whatever animal it is that they come and retrieve, uh, which I thought was pretty sad. Um, so go online if you should happen to have a bat somewhere where you don't want it to be and look for uh, a bat rescue in your area. Uh, around here, honest to God, you know, if you can find, if you can track Troy or myself down, we'll figure out something to save the bat. Bats of Southwest Ohio, little brown bats, big brown bats, Indiana bats, and Eastern red bats. I did not know about Eastern red bats, so I actually learned something new while I was preparing this presentation. This is a little brown bat, and he was up in my attic, and I took a picture of him. Uh, we left him up there for most of the winter because we just didn't really go up there, and he seemed happy, and we were happy to leave him there, and life was good. Um, a little brown bat and the big brown bats are known as house bats. They have, hibernate in buildings in the winter. The little brown bats are three to four inches long with an eight to 10 inch wingspan. Pups are born in the fall. They eat large quantities of insects. Uh, they are food for other animals. So that's kind of one of the things that, um, like what, what are bats good for? Not only do they eat insects, but they're also food for larger animals. They control agricultural pests, like we talked before, $1 billion a year just in corn crops. And they're in, uh, indicators of environmental change. Bats like a nice clean environment. They like um, to have their forestry, forested areas. And uh, once your environment starts to go, go down, you will start losing your bat populations. We're losing lots of bats now uh, because of decreased habitat, because of pesticides. Like I said, that those pesticides go into the food chain. Next bat is the big brown bat. It's also known as uh, a house bat. It hibernates in buildings. It's four to five inches long and has a 13 to 14 inch wingspan. Um, and I understand you bat haters that uh, the, those are those are some some big wingspans to be flying at you. Um, don't scream because they do fly towards noise and they use echolocation. So just stand there quietly, leave them alone, and they will fly somewhere else. Their pups are also born in the fall. Uh, what I found out about uh, bat mating is that they are totally promiscuous and uh, kind of like orgies. So um, whenever you see all these bats flying around. They're just, uh, all they want to do is mate. Uh, they also eat small beetles, are their most common prey for your big brown bat. Uh, they'll eat anywhere. They will eat over water. They will eat over grass. They will eat in, in trees. Uh, so they really don't care where they eat. They just want to eat. Uh, they are ranked among the most beneficial animals in America. The Indiana bat. The Indiana bat is on both the state and federal endangered species list. They are endangered due to hibernation disturbance. 
from people going into caves whenever they shouldn't go into caves. Uh, there's a couple of caves that we went to. Carter Caves has a big bat population. They closed that cave during the winter so that you can't go in and they still have people who break in and disturb the bats. Uh, they're kind of small little bats, 1.5 inches to three inches long with only a nine to 10 inch wingspan. They feed entirely on night flying insects and they can eat up to 300 insects per, per feeding. And their population, not only are they suffering from hibernation disturbance, but they are just suffering from the white nose syndrome uh, that from cave dwelling bats. They are doing some study now. Lynn, have you seen this? That um, something with <laughs> banana peels, that they're having some response to the white nose syndrome. No. Yeah. So yeah, see if. The Eastern red bat, is he not cute? I would just love to have one of those. Uh, he's three and a half to four and a half inches long with a 13 inch wingspan. He likes to live in forested areas. So um, lives in deciduous or coniferous trees. Uh, he is the most common tree bat in Ohio. And they are also insectivores and they eat many moths and beetles. Moths. These are the um, this the the characteristics of moths, and for the most part, they're just the opposite of butterflies. Uh, moths' wings lie flat whenever they're setting, or whenever they're they're um, or they're open whenever they sit flat. Uh, their antenna are kind of feathery, and butterflies have clubs uh, like are clubbed. They have a thick, fuzzy body. For the most part, they're nocturnal. They make a cocoon instead of a chrysalis. Lots of times moths, moth cocoons are down in the leaves under your trees. It's another one of those reasons not to, not to rake um, all of your leaves and certainly not to mulch them. Uh, if you can have a, what we call a wild place in your yard where you can at least, if you've got to move your leaves from where they are, rake them back into that wild place and leave them alone because uh, there are some cocoons that look exactly like a rolled up leaf. Uh, and whenever you mulch those up, you just destroy all those cocoons. They're very important for pollination and they are, their caterpillars particularly are food sources for songbirds. Luna moth, we actually took this picture of this Luna moth over at Shawnee State Park. Uh, whenever we went over there for our spring safari, uh, they are absolutely gorgeous. They're three to four and a half inch uh, wingspan. They're attracted to light. Uh, they are most likely found in forested areas. They, uh, they can be in suburban areas with larger trees. Their host plants, which means this is what their caterpillars live on, are birch, cherry, elm, linden, oak, poplar, and willow. And um, by coincidence, oak and cherry and willow are the three best trees to plant for caterpillars um, they support the most. An oak tree alone can support over 500 species of caterpillars. And I think I already said their caterpillars are a great source, food source for songbirds. A promethea moth, it's uh, three to three, three point seven inches, almost maybe four inches. They're attracted to light as well. They're common in the southern part of Ohio. They're found in forests, forest edges, and woodlands. Their host plants are uh, or uh, native cherry trees and sassafras, spice bush, sweet gum, and tulip tree. I did not know that one of their host plants was spice bush. I would just be really excited if I got a spice bush swallowtail on my spice bush. Um, but if I got one of these, I would be so excited. The Cecropia moth. I actually saw one of these. This is not my picture. Um, I saw one of these in our maple tree a couple of years ago. And of course I had no camera with me because that's the way life goes. It has a four to six inch wingspan. You can see how large they are on that person's hand. Uh, it's the largest regularly occurring moth in Ohio. They are not strongly attracted to light. They do not eat from the time that they uh, come out of their cocoon to be a moth. Their sole function is to mate. So the only time they eat is whenever they are caterpillars. They only live about a week, which is pretty sad. 
Uh, they're found mostly in woodlands and forests and their host plants are alders, ash, birch, elm, oak, and willow. And due to the ash um, deforestation that we've had, we've, we've seen a decrease in these numbers. Our next nighttime animal are owls. Owls are amazing little creatures. Um, they are nocturnal. Uh, they can rotate their necks 270 degrees. And if you look at that on a protractor, that is pretty darn far. I didn't know this, but a group of owls are called a parliament. So now whenever you see them, you can think of them sitting around in their little white wigs. Owls hunt other owls. Uh, great horn owls will actually hunt the smaller barred owls, which I didn't know. They hunt insects. They hunt small mammals and other birds. They are almost silent in flight. They have special feathers um, that allow them to, uh, you, you, you don't even hear them whenever they flap their wings. Our cutest little owl in Ohio is called the Eastern Screech Owl. He's the smallest and most common. Uh, he's only eight and a half inches tall with a 20 inch wingspan. Look at that little face and those eyes. <laughs> they prefer large trees, but they live in both urban and suburban settings. So you can get those in your neighborhoods. Uh, they have the most varied diet of any owl. They will eat just about anything and they are cavity nesters. So those dead trees that have, that have nooks and crag, crags and stuff, that's where these little guys like to live. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Our next owl is barn owl. Um, you, you will notice these that they have the big white heart shaped face. They're about 16 inches tall and they have a three and a half foot wingspan. When they fly over, you know that they have flown. They do not chew their prey, they swallow it whole. They are strictly nocturnal. That's the only time you'll see them out. They eat voles, shrews, and mice. And some of these other uh, things that they eat are other nocturnal animals. So they, they like to eat the things that are out at nighttime. Uh, this is our great horned owl. Lynn, this is actually our great horned owl from out at the Armco Park from this year. Uh, she was a first time mom who built her nest in uh, the where two branches came apart and she was 10 feet off the ground, if that. If yeah. that. Yes. Really close to the road. Really close to the road. Uh, the kids were playing soccer darn near right under her nest. And we kept thinking, oh my God, this is just a disaster waiting to happen. And the babies won't live. And, 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 and she had three eggs, um, two of them hatched. And both of those owlets lived all the way to um, fledging and leaving. And unfortunately, she will probably come back next year because she was very successful in that nest. <laughs> so luckily they do like to move the nest around. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Uh, the great horned owl are, are named for their large ear tufts. She was just beautiful. It's the second most common owl in Ohio. It's the largest owl in Ohio. Uh, they are monogamous. They mate for life. But we never saw her mate. I'm okay with that. You're okay with that. <laughs> uh, they... They eat, um, they eat rabbits and voles and mice as well. They're 22 inches tall and 44 inch wingspan. Ladies and gentlemen, that is almost four feet. We didn't see her fly either. Um, the, her two owlets were absolutely beautiful. It took, she fed them a long time. Uh, someone had pictures of her eating uh, or of her feeding them a garter snake. Uh, someone had pictures of her feeding them uh, mice. So yeah, pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna go back to owls for just a minute. We also had this year uh, a snowy owl that was down by the um, uh, Paul Brown Stadium. I don't know if anybody saw any of the, the social media presence of that. Uh, she was absolutely beautiful. Uh, everyone worried about her. She lived up between two of the pylons under 75. 
Uh, and it was always funny because people would go and take pictures of her and other people would be like, oh my God, you're going to scare her and she's going to fly away and we're never going to see her again. And it's like, people, she lives under I-75. I think that if she was going to be scared away, she would have been scared away by the semis who are driving five feet above her head. Um, but she was really cool. They got they got a lot of pictures of her uh, eating the same sorts of things. She would be eating moles and rats and 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 kind of and that kind of stuff. Um, so if you're quiet and if you're observant, uh, these owls are out there and and seen. Um, I did not get to go down and see the snowy owl. I wish I had, uh, hopefully she'll come back next year. Cause she seemed to be pretty happy down there as well. They named her. What did they name her? I can't remember. Something. Who day? Oh, I think they did. They named her who day. So we'll see if who day comes back next year. A more local great horned owl yes. nest is Gilmore Ponds. For several years now, there's been a great horned owl nesting. Can you guys hear Lynn? Uh, within Gilmore Ponds, the nest has been moving every year. Uh, but this year and three years ago, it was right along the trail. And so a lot of people got to see the baby owlets um, kind of poking their heads out the nest. And then when they were they were branching out. Yeah. And fi finally, when they, f they fledged, but close up look to the mother as she flew down over my head one of the days I was out there walking my dogs and she was big and she was silent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, why are some animals nocturnal? Oh, hang on. What's my button? Uh, there are fewer predators out at night unless, of course, the owls are out looking for you. Uh, it's easier to avoid to avoid detection because it's dark, unless of course we have light pollution, and that's another one of the reasons why we need to make sure that we have less light pollution, uh, because these animals are easier, ease more easily detected. Then um, there are prey animals out, so the moles, the voles, the mice. There's less competition; uh, they don't have as many other animals out there eating their their diet as there are during the daytime. And nighttime is cooler. Uh, I, if I can mow the grass at one o'clock in the morning and my neighbors would be happy with that, uh, I would be out there doing it as well. Um, my favorite a nocturnal animal in the United States is the possum. It's our only marsupial in North America. This one has a cute little set of babies. Um, my, my favorite story is uh, we had a groundhog at the house so we sat up and have a heart trap and apparently we had a baby possum as well. So we went out and I had put cantaloupe out and here's this baby possum and she's smiling up at Troy and Troy lets her out and goes, yeah, go away. We just want the groundhog. So we put more cantaloupe in there and the next morning Troy goes out and there's the little baby possum smiling like thanks for supper for the second night. Um, so we shoot her away and sure as heck the third morning, here's the little baby possum. And now she thinks that it's just like, you know, free food every night. Uh, so we had to leave the have a heart trap, um, uh, put away for a few nights so that she stopped thinking that that was her own little smorgasbord. Uh, they are 13 to 37 inches long. I don't think I've ever seen a 37 inch long possum. I mean, that's three feet. Uh, and they can have tails that are eight to 19 inches long. Uh, I truly have never seen a possum on those upper numbers. And if I did, I would, uh, I would not go near it. Uh, they are omnivores, which is a nice way of saying they will eat anything that doesn't eat them. They are scavengers. They will eat carcasses. They will eat trash, pet food, eggs, small invertebrates, birds, uh, birds and their eggs, rodents, frogs, uh, the best thing about, about possums is that they eat ticks. Uh, I couldn't find an actual number for how many ticks a possum can eat, uh, but we have two dogs and it makes me sleep better at night knowing that they, we have possums in the backyard eating the ticks. Uh, I found out that playing possum is actually involuntary. Uh, they freak out, they roll over on their side. They will actually, their heart rate goes down, their, uh, their respirations go down. They start drooling this really rancid, nasty mucus. 
And uh, it can last from a few minutes to up to six hours. And they have no control as to when they get up and walk away, which I did not know. Did you know that? Yes. Yeah. Um, and um, they don't start playing possum until they are adults. Raccoons, they are omnivores as well. They will eat anything and they will live anywhere. Um, he's really cute, but I've seen some that aren't that cute. Uh, they are 24 to 38 inches in size. They are solitary except during mating season. They do keep our yards free of pests like wasps and rodents. Uh, and they're very important in the removal of carrion uh, or carcasses. So they will, they will drag those off down into the sewers where they live and they will eat off of roadkill for days. And then they come out and look really cute like that and they want to hug, but I don't. Um, and my last slide is about fireflies and lightning bugs. Um, we are losing our lightning bugs at a surprising and alarming rate for two reasons. Uh, one, because I mentioned before about raking leaves, fireflies actually spend like 80% of their life down in, in your grass, under your grass, uh, and they need those leaves for their habitat. So raking those leaves away uh, ends up killing the, the lightning bugs and um, we're losing them. Uh, stop the lawn chemicals as well. Uh, we have uh, a thought that, I don't know if you remember, last year after our cicada invasion, we had that bird thing that was going around where we had, okay. So from the studies that I read, they think that what was killing the birds was that all these cicadas had come up out of the ground after 17 years and that they had been underground for 17 years soaking up all of these chemicals. And whenever the birds ate them, it made the birds sick. Um, so stop using pesticides, no lawn chemicals, and no mosquito sprays. I just had this conversation the other day with the garden club that I was talking to. Um, the Mosquito Joe signs just make me very sad. Um, it, it, I know that they like to tell you that their, that their spray will only kill mosquitoes, uh, but that's not true. It would be like saying, well, we have this chemical that will only kill redheaded females, uh, but no other humans. And that's not true. If it kills one bug, it's going to kill all bugs. Uh, so don't believe the, it only kills mosquitoes. Um, it, they, uh, facts about lightning bugs. Uh, they aren't flies at all. They're actually beetles. Uh, they have the most efficient light in the world. So their lights are caused by chem a chemical reaction and it truly was deeper than anything that I wanted to share with you. But nearly 100% of the chemical reaction uh, of the energy from that chemical reaction becomes light. The light they produce could be green, yellow, or orange. Everybody loves lightning bugs. Um, leave your leaves and uh, don't use lawn chemicals. And they can use their, their light to scare off predators. Uh, some fireflies eat other types of fireflies. And humans are the most contributing factor to the firefly decline. Uh, and questions or comments from anyone? I have a few comments. Oh, good. So <coughs> there is an- Because I can't see those. Um, <coughs> You can stop share at the top. Okay. Then you'll see faces. All right. Hi! So there is an Ohio bat working group and they are holding um, a huge bat event this year on August 19th and 20th up at Germantown Metro Park. That's what Melissa's doing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we, we work with an educator from Warren Soil and Water who's part of this bat working group. So she'll be going out helping, but they're yeah. actually um, capturing bats and tagging them and releasing again, kind of yeah. like a monarch tagging event. It's banding. It's kind of like yeah. bird banding. Yeah. So the, um, it, it, the event is near capacity. So I will attempt to post this Can on our share website. that link? Okay. Um, because the, it's a bit goofy. It's a really long website. Yes. Um, there is also, if you're into fireflies, 
uh, the Butler Metro Park system has put a small firefly garden in at Elk Creek Metro Park, which you might know as the old Weatherwax golf course. It's really teeny tiny. Um, Nicole and I were out there last week or the week before uh, doing a kids program. And so she dived into the bushes to go see what kind of plants were growing there. <laughs> um, she was braver than I was. I was scared of ticks. Um, <laughs> Uh, you need but, some possums there. But it will, um, if you want to check that out, Metro Parks is planning to do a firefly program sometime in the near future. She's just not quite sure when it will be yet. And then there was a third thing, and it's totally lost me just now, but it will come back to me and I'll share it later. Mm. We also, there's a, a thing called Moth Palooza that they do every year. It was just a couple of weeks ago, July 15th to the 17th. Um, if you're on social media, they do have a Facebook page. If you just Google Moth Palooza 2022, and that's a, it's a pretty cool event. Um, they go and they put these big sheets up and they put light, they backlight them and the moths land on them and you can get some amazing pictures. Uh, they did that a couple of nights when we were over in Sean uh, we didn't make it out for it, uh, but the Moth Palooza, and apparently it's, um, you need to sign up rather quickly, or otherwise there must be a, a lot of moth lovers out there that we didn't know about. Um, hold up. Hold this. Ah, here we go. Uh, so um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife has a ton of books. I'm not quite sure what they have in stock just now, but the one that Kathy's holding up is the Owls of Ohio book. They also have moths of Ohio. Um, they haven't created have fireflies one. of Ohio because yeah. there's not quite enough of those um, <laughs> to create an a, entire it, book. Of it would be a very small book. Yeah, but do look on their website because they have them all as PDFs yeah, here on their we go. website. Uh, this is my, You'll have to hold where'd it, it go? There we go. Or not. It's that background you've got going it on. It is that background. It's Troy's background. There we go. Moths of Ohio. And then, yes, Owls of Ohio. Um, but yeah, if you, uh, this one's yours. Uh, if you Google those uh, Moths of Ohio field guide, you will be able to find that PDF and you can download it. Yeah. Awesome. Or visit the New Nature Center, uh, Houston Woods. They might have copies. Of ah, it. there you go. All right. So, Nicole, you're up next. All right. Let's see if I can figure out how to get this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also not proficient at Zoom, so. Great. Okay. Okay. So there's that. Well, I don't know how to start it from here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so. Um, hi, I'm Nicole. Um, I work uh, with Lynn at uh, Butler Soil and Water. Um, and I'm also about to graduate from Cincinnati State. Woo! Um, and uh, I'm doing uh, sustainable horticulture. But I decided to do this presentation on um, uh, the southern flying squirrel because it's a really cool nocturnal animal that a lot of people don't realize is just right here uh, in our backyards. So um, I wanted to start off with just our most common squirrels which we see all the time, right? There's the Eastern gray squirrel, American red squirrel, which you don't see as often. There's the fox squirrel. Um, these, are, these are all squirrels that you would assume are the most common squirrels in Ohio, but there's also the amazing Southern flying squirrel, which is actually Ohio's most common squirrel. Um, a lot of people have never seen them. So, you might be saying like, what? That's crazy. I've never seen a flying squirrel. There's no way that they're the most common squirrel in Ohio. You see gray squirrels every freaking day in your backyard, right? But these squirrels, um, according to the department, hold on, let me move this because I can't read my own slide. According to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, the Southern flying squirrel is Ohio's most prolific squirrel. So it's just everywhere. Um, most Hawaiian, Ohioans have no idea that they live right next to these really cool flying animals. They're not really flying, but 
um, they rarely leave the safety of the canopy. Um, and they're generally very shy creatures. Um, so that's really why we don't see them. Whoa. I love, I, I, they're just the goofiest looking animals. They're so cute. Um, so some facts um, at maturity, the Southern Flying Squirrel is only going to be eight to 10 inches. So they're really small, they can fit in your hand. Um, and they weigh two to four ounces. They're just these tiny little things. Um, <clears throat> like I said before, they don't truly fly, um, but they have a fold that they stretch out, like you saw in the last picture, um, called the potassium, which allows them to glide through the air. And they do this from one tree to another. Um, and they can go as far as the, the furthest that anyone's ever recorded was 80 meters, which is 250 feet, which is crazy. Um, but they generally don't go that far. It's usually around 30 to 100 feet, which is still crazy. Um, they're highly social. Uh, they live together in cavities of trees and in snags, which are dead trees. Um, and they also like to dwell in old woodpecker holes. That's how small they are. <laughs> and also in man-made structures. Um, sometimes people will get them in their houses, just like bats. Um, they are obviously, they're nocturnal. Um, they have these big eyes so that they can see in the dark. Um, and they live almost their entire lives um, up in trees. They're rarely ever on the ground. They're actually really, really um, like bad at running around on the ground. So they try to get up into a tree as soon as possible. They're actually really fast. Um, they have a flattened tail um, and it helps them adjust the angle while in flight. So they can actually, while like jumping and soaring through the air, they can turn at full 90 degrees, um, which is, crazy. So they, they can just kind of maneuver around trees. Um, they're definitely acrobats. And most of the noises that they make are undetectable to the human ear. Um, but they do make some noises that we can hear. Uh, I tried to put a video clip. Let me see if it works. I don't know if everybody can hear that. So yeah, the, the sound they make is, is really quiet and it's, it's hard to differentiate between all the other sounds that you hear at night, especially. Um, but if you listen to the, uh, that clip, you can find it online really easily. It was like the first uh, clip I found when I looked up flying squirrel um, sounds, Southern flying squirrel sounds. Um, if you listen to it a few times, I'm sure that you could be able to identify it at night. But they, Okay, this is the cutest. This is a little, a little baby. They're just so cute. I just want to hold them. You can actually have them as pets too. Um, you can have them as pets in Ohio, which is pretty cool. Um, not in every state, but here you can. Um, so uh, their range. This is their range. Uh, the map that you see right here. Uh, so it's from southeastern Canada all the way down to Florida and all the way out to the Midwest. Um, and then there's also some pockets of them in Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. Um, so they're actually like all over the place, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> I lived in Maine most of my life. I never saw flying squirrels there and there's lots of trees there. Um, and yeah, so their preferred habitat is forest. So they like to live um, with uh, maples, beaches, hickories, oaks, poplars, um, just like a bunch of different hardwoods, uh, which are all trees that we have in abundance here. Um, their favorite is hickory, so they really love hickory nuts um, and acorns for when they're storing food for the winter. Uh, they feed on pretty much everything, actually. They're, they're, the, they're true scavengers, but they, they eat a lot of fruits and nuts uh, from re red and white oaks and hickories and beaches. Um, they store food in the winter, but they don't hibernate. Um, they just kind of uh, try to conserve energy in the colder months. 
Um, they also consume like bugs, different types of buds, mushrooms. Um, a really weird one that they eat, which I'll get into in a minute, is mycorrhizal fungi, uh, so mycelia, which is a very specific kind of fungi that grows underneath the ground. Um, they also eat carrion, so they eat you know, carcasses. Um, they'll eat bird eggs and nestlings. Um, they also eat flowers. They'll, they'll eat pretty much anything. Um, so they're, they're a really cool animal. Oh, look at him go. I just love him. <laughs> they just look so cool. And he's got like a big old nut in his mouth. He's ready. Um, so ecological benefits. Um, the things that are really great about Southern flying squirrels is they do a lot of seed dispersal. Um, that's one way to know if you have flying squirrels is they, they kind of like shell nuts and they leave a lot of shells at the bottom of the trees. They go through so many nuts. It's actually crazy. Um, they act as key seed dispersers of not only hardwood trees um, because they help break open those seeds and everything, um, but also fruiting bodies of subterranean fungi. So fungi that grows under the ground um, and they eat it, they dig it up and eat it and then it's dispersed through their feces. Um, this is actually really important. Um, so the fungi mycelia are known to be highly beneficial for tree growth and maintenance um, because of their asso association with tree roots. They create this really cool symbiotic relationship with tree roots um, which allows all the different trees in a forest to share nutrients and water with each other. Um, and they also, they extend the roots of trees so that they can go further and deeper um, and get different kinds of nutrients. They help uh, create pockets in the soil um, that make it so that trees can take up uh, certain kinds of metals that are hard for trees to take up. Mycorrhizal fungi are so, so, so important. Um, you can go to like garden centers and buy mycorrhizal fungi for your plants um, because we've we found that having them um, as part of a plant system is super beneficial. Um, there are things that we don't even understand about how beneficial it is. And these little critters dig it up and eat it and poop it out, like spread it around everywhere. So that's like a really cool benefit that uh, these squirrels have. I didn't even know that until I did this presentation. I learned that about them. Um, I just thought they were really cute and cool and mysterious because no one ever sees them. Um, I've never seen one before. So I hope one day I will, because look at that face. Oh my God, who doesn't want to see that? Because I do. So how to help. Um, they don't necessarily need our help. They're actually nowhere near endangered. They're so prolific. They're very common. They're the most common squirrel in the area. Um, but they do have many, many benefits to our ecosystem. And we do want to keep them around. Um, so if you do have a backyard that happens to have trees or you're near like any preserves or um, any nature centers or anywhere where there's lots of trees, there's guaranteed to be some flying squirrels there. Um, and they, uh, they're always in dens. So they're very, very social. So they always kind of like sleep in big dens together. Um, so you'll always see, a, well, you won't see them. You'll probably never see them, but you'll, um, they'll always be um, near each other. And so there's always some, you know, den of squirrel, of flying squirrels somewhere, um, which is actually kind of fun to think about. Um, but so one thing you can do is if you have a bigger property um, and it's always tempting to remove dead trees, once you know they start dying, you think, oh, that's useless, I need to get rid of it. Um, but if it's not anywhere that's gonna pose a threat to your house, or, um, obviously if it's near your house, take it down. But um, if it's not gonna pose a threat to your home or any humans, um, maybe consider just kind of keeping it there because not only just for flying squirrels, but you know, uh, the multitude of animals that we've talked about tonight can benefit from those. They're called snags, just those dead trees. Um, and we see them as an eyesore or useless, but really they um, host so many animals and fungi and, and things that we need. Um, and then uh, ironically, 
I was, <laughs> I also was thinking about how lighting is such an important aspect to nocturnal animals when I made this presentation. Um, and so, you know, to bring it back to the, the point uh, that Troy was making about keeping outside lighting to a minimum, um, put it on a motion sensor and a timer um, so that you're not disturbing these creatures in their natural habitat at their natural time. Because, um, I mean, we all know how important that is, especially since Troy just told us. So, <laughs> um, but any nocturnal creature will benefit from that for sure. And that's it. I could probably come up with about 100 other things to talk about with flying squirrels, but I felt like those were the most important parts. <laughs> um, okay, so stop sharing. Okay. Those pictures were so cute. Oh, yeah. one. You, uh, there's like, it's, there's not that many pictures of flying squirrels because they're really hard to get good pictures of. So yeah, I was really happy with the ones that I got on there for sure. Every time a new picture came on the screen, we we're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just so cute. It's like, how do you not want those around? And they are around. They're everywhere, apparently. So. Yeah, Troy squeals were the loudest of them all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm surprised I didn't get a dirty look for that. <laughs> <laughs> he's ignoring us. Yeah, he's getting very good at ignoring us. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions for Nicole or for Kathy or for Troy? I was wondering if there's um, some sort of uh, handout or flyer we could give to our neighbors who are having mosquito Joe spray their yard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will see if I can find one and I will get it to Lynn and see if we can put a link to it whenever she shares this other information. That, that would be helpful because, you know, my going over and saying it's doing this is, is not as uh, impactful as if there's something from OSU or somewhere that says, please don't do this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's just an ongoing battle that we have with, with using pesticides and insecticides all the time. Uh, but yeah, de definitely um, there, are, there should be some literature out there saying that they're not effective. Kathy, were you one of the people I emailed today with the link? Me? Are you talking about me? Yeah. No, I, no. Okay, I was just going to say because if you were, then if I, I would have your email address to send it um, straight to you. But if you um, if you have an email address and you're willing to share it in the chat, then Kathy will have it to send something okay. to you. Okay, I got to find the chat. I got it. Okay. I got to find it as well because it's closed <laughs> in ours just now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so our next, where did your paper go again? I'm going to totally steal your paper. Sorry. I'm really bad. I'm stealing stuff from um, Cindy, who's sitting here. <laughs> um, so yeah, as Troy mentioned, the next session will be on Monday, November 7th. And the first portion will be drainage and water features. And that'll be Ashley Widener from our office. We get a lot of calls about drainage issues and all the rest. So we figured we'd lump that into backyard wildlife because along with that, JT from OSU Extension is gonna be talking about amphibians of Ohio. I asked him if he's going to include the soundtrack just like he did for the bird session that oh he did gosh. back in 2021, which was awesome. And he said, we'll see. So <laughs> he is not on here just now because he was on, um, he was up at the state fair today and he wasn't sure when he would manage to get back, but he, um, he was um, hoping to get on here tonight and I see he didn't make it. So let me make sure I get her yep. email address. Um, before we shut everything down for the night, Kathy is going to quickly scribble down that email address so that she knows who she's contacting. Kathy, there's a ton of paper, paper on the end of the table. Oh, yeah. I think and I've got a pen right here. I need a pen. <laughs> While you're doing that, I just wanted to say we had uh, a flying squirrels in our attic and uh, we, we oh. ended up trapping them and, 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 and getting them out of there. But uh, it was the only reason we knew that is we could hear them running around. <laughs> I mean, not, you know, their feet running around. So we yeah. realized we had them. And the builder came and filled up the holes and they'd never been back. But but that was interesting because I'd never seen them either. 
So yeah, I, go ahead. I was gonna say it's it's crazy how how many animals are out there that you don't really know, and yeah, that that's really cool though. Yeah, he said he's had that happen several times that they've gotten in the attic. I didn't realize they were yeah, so common, tiny. so that must be why. Yeah. Yeah, they're little guys. Yeah. While we were sitting in the May session where we were learning about dealing with nuisance wildlife, my husband was texting me up a storm because he discovered we had mice in our attic. I kind of wish <laughs> I it forgot about him. that. <laughs> you flying squirrel. You're like, dang it, so close. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, just a little smaller and not nearly as cute. Yeah. <laughs> well, if there's no other questions, then um, I guess we'll wrap up for the night. So thank you everyone for joining us and we hope you'll join us again November 7th. And thank you, Nicole, Troy and Kathy for presenting tonight. Yeah, awesome. thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Thank Take care, bye. Good night.